Welcome back. In the previous video in this section on forces, I built this particular example where there are two forces at play. A gravity force that's always being applied to the mover object, and when I click the mouse, a wind force is being applied to the mover object. What I want to do in this video is look at how I might consider this mover object to have the property mass and how that might affect how the gravity and wind forces behave. And in truth, for me to be able to demonstrate this effectively, it's only meaningful if I have two objects with different masses. Because if I just have one, scaling the mass is just something that will ultimately scale the strength, the relative strength of those forces. So let's quickly add a second object to this example. Now you might already be thinking to yourself, Ugh! What did you just do there? If you're going to have more than one object, should you use an array, or isn't there a different way of doing this? And yes, yes, yes. And ultimately, what I want to do with these examples is build arrays into them to collect many objects and sort of add and subtract them from the canvas itself. But just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to leave these as two separate variables, mover A and mover B. I'm going to apply both forces to them and call update edges and show on both of them. Let's see if that works. There we go. Let's apply the wind. You can see how they're kind of in lockstep together. Maybe mass will change that. So both are bouncing and responding to the wind force. Now let's think about where I want to add mass. So looking at the mover object, there's position, velocity, acceleration, and r. And r is a property that is tied to the size that I'm drawing the ellipse. Let's just add mass as its own property for a moment. This dot mass equals 1. And the reason why I want to do this is remember Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, or restated as acceleration equals force divided by mass. And remember, the way that I'm implementing this is all of the forces divided by mass are being accumulated into the object's acceleration. So first and foremost, I need to add this, I need to incorporate this divide by mass into my apply force function. Right here, I can then say force dot divide by this dot mass. Before I add the force into the acceleration, divide by mass. Let's try running this. Okay, good, same result. Well, the mass is just one. So let's now add mass equals two, which I should see the acceleration. The force remains the same, but the, the strength of the acceleration should be divided by two. <gasps> Wait, what's going on? Ah, something's weird going on. Why are they different? They shouldn't be different. They don't have different masses. Something's crazy is going on. Do you remember, oh, a few videos back, I spent all this time talking about static functions. Random 2D is a static function. It's called on p5.vector rather than like this function, mult for multiply, which is just called on v, the object itself. There was a purpose to that. There was a meaning to that. There was a reason for that. And that reason, that moment is right now. I want to divide force by mass, but not the actual force vector itself. I just want to take that vector get a copy of it, divide it by mass, and then add that to the acceleration. The reason is because out here, right, I'm taking this wind vector and applying it to A and B. And I don't want A to mess with it because I, it, wind should stay the same when it applies to B. But this function itself is actually taking that force vector and dividing it by two and changing its value. So there's different ways I could do it. I could make a copy of it and then divide it, but I could also use the static version of divide. In other words, I could say, and I need a new vector to store the result in. I'll just call it f, p5.vector.divide force by this dot mass. So here I am saying, take that force, divide it by mass, and store the result in a new vector f, and then that vector f is what gets applied to the acceleration itself. And of course, I need to remove this line of code, which I no longer want, and there we go. So now mass is playing a role, but it's not affecting externally the environment, and it's just a property of the object that's affecting the way the force changes the acceleration. So let's take the logical next step and give each of these objects a different mass. 
So I'm going to add a third property to the constructor, call it M. And then in, uh, when I create the objects, let's give one a mass of two and one a mass of four. And again, I'm just picking numbers out of a hat, totally arbitrary. So remember, the one on the right will have a higher mass than the one on the left. Oh, interesting. This, this is correct according to Newton's second law, right? If acceleration is force divided by mass, if an object has a larger mass, it will accelerate less. And this makes sense. Think about the force that you have to apply to an object. An object with a greater mass is going to be, you're going to need a much stronger force to get it to accelerate than something with a much smaller mass. Think of a bowling ball This is a ping pong ball. How much force do you need to apply to get those both to accelerate equally? Something is not right here. You might recall <laughs> or have heard about Galileo's famous leading Tower of Pisa experiment where, you know, the, as the story goes in the late 1600s, Galileo is said to have dropped two spheres of different masses from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And did, they fall, did one fall faster than the other? No, they, fall, they fell at the same rate, independent of their mass. And the reason for this is because the weight of an object, weight being the force, gravitational, gravity, I'm really using the wrong term here. I really should be saying the gravitational acceleration. The force is the weight, and the weight of an object is scaled according to its mass. The bigger the mass, the bigger the force. The smaller the mass, the smaller the force. So for this to work more accurately, I should really say let weight A equal P5 dot vector multiply gravity times mover A dot mass. And weight B is that same thing, multiplying mover B's mass and then I'm going to apply weight A and weight B. So this is a little bit, I'm like sort of fudging things a little bit just to like take this gravitational vector and then multiply, scale it according to mass before I apply it in where it then gets divided by mass. Let's just see if this works. Perfect, they're both falling at the same rate. Now let's apply wind. The acceleration due to wind is less when the mass is larger, and that's the way it should be. The thing is, it's kind of hard to see what's going on here because I'm drawing them at the same size. This is a nice moment for us to think about. If I have two objects, and I'm going to just erase this here. If I have object A, and the mass of object A is 2, and then I have object B, and the mass of object B is 4. Well, certainly if the density of these things is the same, but what is the density here? I mean, these are just pixels, but let's, let's consider the density to be the same, then I might want to draw mass B, object B, larger than object A. So one idea could be like, oh, the radius could be equal to the mass. So here the radius is 2, and here the radius is 4. But that's not really the right scale. Because what should really map, at least in my mind, to the mass is the area. So the area of this should be twice the area of this. What's the formula for the area of a circle? Pi r squared. So in that sense, I think a proper um, mapping would be to take the square root of the mass. And why is that? Let's say, in this case, the radius is square root of 2, and in this case, the radius is square root of 4. Well, pi, the, surface, the surface area, the area, pi r squared would be 2 pi, and here, pi r squared would be 4 pi. Whereas if I used 2 and 4, I would have 4 pi and 16 pi. Because I'd be squaring 2, I get 4. Squaring 4, I get 16. So take that mass take the square root of it and apply that to the object's radius. In other words, this dot r equals the square root of this dot mass. Let's take a look at what this looks like. Okay, well those things are so tiny. They're so tiny. So I'm gonna scale it arbitrarily, multiply it by 10, and we can see 
this object has a higher mass. Now, why are they kind of bouncing out of sync now? Well, it's because they're, they're hitting the bottom at different times <laughs> because their size is larger, which is fine. I kind of, that's visually what I want. And now you'll see the acceleration of the smaller one be much higher with the wind. Ultimately, I'm making so many arbitrary decisions here, and there's many inaccuracies. But I'm attempting to at least take the ideas from real-world physics and apply them to the best of my ability in a way that feels accurate. So one of the things I might suggest to you are there's things that you see that I've missed, things that, I've, that are inaccuracies or don't feel right to you in terms of how, if these were physical materials, they would behave. Certainly, they would collide with each other. That's an interesting, that's a whole other can of worms to open that I'll come back to another time. But what types of elements can you apply to this? Could you add an array now? Could you think about um, how you visually design these objects? Maybe you want to represent a different masses in a different way through color or some other way of visually indicating that. But for me, the thing that I want to do now is I want to revisit essentially what I'm doing in these two lines of code, where I say let wind equal create vector number comma number. Let gravity equal create vector number comma number. Is there not a better way or a different way that I might approach the calculation of a force vector in the environment? And that ultimately is looking up a formula for how a force is calculated based on the properties and conditions of the environment. And so the three forces I want to look at are friction, drag, which is kind of like friction but different, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that, as well as gravitational attraction between bodies in space. So I'm going to look at those as kind of case studies in different formulas. Maybe you'll have some ideas of ways you can look at other forces or invent your own forces, but I'm going to return at least in the next video and just think about friction specifically when these two objects are in contact with the edge. How might they realistically slow down as if there's a contact friction between those objects and the surface or the edge of the canvas itself?